Hello, this is Christian Okoye, former Kansas City Chiefs. You are listening to Grilling Truth. Welcome to the Grilling Truth NFL Legend Show, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, an interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. I'm your host for the Legend Show, Mike Goodpaster, and I want to welcome in my co-host, who's giddy with excitement because he's a 49ers fan, Matt Andrews Gavin. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Yes, yes, I am. This was, uh, I remember uh, being in high school, and uh, our guest tonight was uh, one of my favorite uh, defensive players when I was in high school, so absolutely. All right, and we're going to go ahead and introduce him. We're not even going to call him a 49er. We're just going to call him the greatest player in Taylor High School football history. Help us welcome to the Grilling Truth, Dana Stubblefield. Hey, hey guys, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Uh, there might be a couple other athletes out there that might want to say, wait a minute, he wasn't the greatest at Taylor High School. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to compete with the Super Bowl ring, Dana. Oh yeah, you can. I guess if you if you put that out there, then yeah, it's kind of hard. That's to true. That. Very true. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's kind of the uh, end of any discussion. All you got to do is show your finger, and then you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> guess, I guess we got to watch how you say "just show your finger" and we go with it. But uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Either way, it'll work. Um, I guess. But, Either way, um, it'll work. You, you want to talk a little bit um, about how you got started playing football um, and oh just some of the people that influenced you when you were younger? <laughs> you know, it's um, one of my relatives, a cousin of mine, who also played a teller and went to University of Miami, uh, Chris, Chris Thompson, Chris Thomas. Uh, he was like, hey, you're a big kid. You need to start playing football. You need to fill out those shirts and do something. And at that time, I was like, nah, I'm just like hanging with the guys, watching, just watching. And then Mr. Houchin at Three Rivers Middle School, you know, he was like, you should play football. And I came out, and I remember to this day, you know, with all the guys I played with my first time, because I was a running back. I didn't want to play offensive lineman because I thought they were too slow. So I said, I want to be in the backfield. The first time I touched the ball, I ran the ball 80 yards for a touchdown. And I look back, and you see the defense laying on the ground because they're hurt or whatever, but the ref called it back. Then Houchin said, run it again. We're doing it. And long and behold, I scored another touchdown. And after that, I was hooked. You know, it was kind of hard to get me, get me off the football field after that. Well, tell us a little bit about your time over at, uh, at Taylor High School. Um, you know, you know you Taylor your was – favorite memories and – Go ahead. Oh, jeez. Oh, my gosh. Taylor was great. I loved it high school because everybody knew each other. My my mom had went to school there. Other, pa- other kids, friends of mine, their parents went to school there. So it was one of those good down-home type schools where the teachers are there that knew your family members and things like that. So for me to go in there, it was it was a blast because as a freshman, I was playing varsity football, but I got to hang around all those varsity guys, Blake Argo, you know, and J.J. Stokes, his older brother, John Stokes. So I got to hang around all these guys and, and things like that. You, you know, with Chad Lyons, who got me into wrestling, uh, guys like that, Blake Argo, becoming good friends of mine, and Denny Weisinger and his, one, his brother, Dwayne, those guys, that's what made Taylor really, really special. And my older brother, Keith, uh, that's, and, you know, Hostrasser, all those guys. That's what made Taylor special is, yeah, we played athletes. And back then, guys, as you know, times have changed. High school, you can play three or four sports a year. You know, you can play baseball, you can do football, you can do all these other sports. And nowadays, you got to really concentrate on one sport. So that's what I loved about high school is I can play all these sports and not worry about, okay, I just got to play football. If I want to play football or, or be good at football, I was able to play all sports. All right, so college, you decided to go to Kansas. I mean, what drew you to Kansas? Uh, really, <laughs> you know, at, at Taylor, there was a math teacher named Mrs. Hornbach, and one thing that stuck out is I was in her math class. It was her math class, and recruiters would come down, and they – would say, hey, we want to see such and such. Can he pull him out of class? 
Well, uh, Mitch Browning came down. He's a recruiter from Kansas, and he tried to pull me out of class. And Ms. Harnbach says, no, Dane is on my time, so you're going to have to wait till afterwards. <laughs> and that was like, and that's why it, that stuck with me, and he's always been on me about, hey, if you're on school time, you better not be messing up because those teachers don't play down there at Taylor High School. <laughs> 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 so he, he was really persistent about getting me. You know, Louisville came down. Uh, you know, Ron Zook had came down at the time with Ohio State. Uh, of course, University of Cincinnati was really all over me. But I just felt like I needed to be outside of the state of Cincinnati to even be willing to even do anything as far as going to college, going to school, and even trying to play a sport. All right, so when you got to Kansas, not the greatest program in the world. I think Glenn Mason had just gotten there recently. Um, you want to tell us about your time at Kansas? I know it ended with an Aloha Bowl win over BYU, and you guys, you were mm-hmm. part of mm-hmm. really turning that program around. So you want to speak about your college years a little bit more? It was great. You know, that as you mentioned, yeah, we were to start, me, Gilbert Brown, who also played in the NFL, Don Davis, uh, we were the, the pretty much the turnaround program. It wasn't. You know, when I got there, Kansas won maybe two games in in one year, and that was against K-State and and Appalachian State or something like that. But the most interesting thing is when I got to Kansas, I was still a fullback. I was a fullback my first month at KU, and I was just messing around with the offense lineman and got down in the stands and ran a couple pass rushes. And that next day, I go down to my locker, and there's number 71, and I'm a defense lineman like that overnight. Just overnight, I was a defense lineman. Hmm. So it was like, wait a minute, I don't know how to play. I know how to play, but I'm a running back. I want to run the ball. I'm going to run people over. That was my thing. Uh, I had a great time with Mace and, and, and all those guys out there. Uh, it was a great learning period for me because uh, – we were turning that program around, so we didn't see success early. So we had to put the time in to really, you know, put the product out there on the field, you know, not just in the classroom but in the weight room and how we came together and trying to turn that program around. Well, after your time at Kansas, you get drafted in uh, 26 overall in the first round of the 93 draft. What was your uh, drafting experience like, and uh, also uh, what was uh, your rookie training camp like and uh, transitioning to the NFL? Oh, geez, it was tough. You know, the draft alone was nerve-wracking uh, because I had all my family. Everybody knows the Heaths, who were my, my step-family. We were down in Indiana on the farm, and everybody came down. It was raining, so we're all up in the in the little house, the little trailer at that time. and and the, what was really frustrating about it is during this whole process, because I went to the NFL Combine, teams would call and talk to me, things like that, the Niners never showed any interest in me at all. Not, not once have they mailed me a letter, talked to me, you know, reached out to me, anything. So when, when I got the phone call from George Seifert saying, hey, Mr. Stane Stubblefield, this is George Seifert, the head coach of the 49ers, would you like to play for the 49ers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what kind of question is that, you know? I didn't know anything about it. So here I am drafting the first round to this great organization. I had to read up on, on, on the 49ers and some of the guys on the defense because, I, you know, I didn't know anything about them. And back then, our rookie camp was five weeks long, and – at that time, where we used to practice training camp was in Rockland, California, which averaged 102 degrees. Oh, yeah, 102 degrees of dry heat, dry heat. Uh, if it were, I was, I quit so many times. <laughs> 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 I don't know how many times after a, a two-day practice, I just I would walk to Terry Heath, who's uh, my stepdad, and he would, I, I quit, I quit. He says, no, 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 you're not. We we got too much going on here. Now you can't. I said, I, I can't learn the plays because in training camp with the NFL, you would put 10, 15 plays in a night, 
I mean, we, you know, you put it, you put in them each night, and you had to learn them that night because we're going to practice them that next day. And you just didn't know out of the 30 you put in in the last two days which one they were going to call. So it was, you know, stressful in that aspect and just trying to learn the plays and fit in uh, was really hard as well. And I, I don't know how many times I quit. And Terry, everybody knows Terry. He's just a little guy, and, and I was just you know, towering over and just shaking my head, no, I quit, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, no, no, like, get back in there. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, like you said, you know, you, you, as, you, uh, as you read up and you got to know some of the guys during your training camp, uh, you're surrounded by all these great players on offense and defense. Uh, did anybody take you under their under their wing at all? Um, and, and how intimidated was it to be drafted by a perennial contender that you know you're going to be competing for a Super Bowl potentially each year? Well, it wasn't it wasn't too intimidating because one thing about the 49ers and organization, they don't allow rookie hazing, which was amazing. Right. I love that. Thank you. Yes, oh, Lord, that's true. Was, that, yeah, they don't allow rookie hazing. Now, as a rookie, you got to take care of your guys on your position. So uh, Kevin Fagan played at University of Miami. Uh, he was a defensive end at that time, and he took me under, under his wing. He showed me how to read film. You know, I used to watch film, but I didn't know what I was watching. And he hey, rookie, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching film. He said, do you even know what you're watching? I'm like, yeah, I'm watching the team about the play. He said, no. What are you looking for? You know, the guy's stance, his hand placement, his feet placement, how far the offense is on the line, which offense, which side of the line is up farther than the other side, where the center put his hand, his elbow, you know, where's the quarterback's feet, how's the quarterback's stance, you know, how's the quarterback's placement of his hands when he gets the ball. So all these little things that helped me in my arsenal as far as being a defensive lineman, Kevin Fagan took me under his wing and showed me how to watch, actually watch film and read film and what I was looking for. All right, now, 1993, you had ten and a half sacks, were named the NFL's Defensive Rookie of the Year. How special was that to be named Defensive Rookie of the Year for you overall? And overall, what was your rookie season like? It was, you know, it was, it was great. It was great because uh, it was amazing because I, I fit right in very well. Uh, Fagan had went down with an injury, and then they put me in the middle and moved one of the inside guys outside. And me, Dennis Brown, Ted Washington, and uh, Todd Kelly, we really, really mesh well. We really start playing well. Um, and as the season got on, I was getting better. So, you know, as we're going and playing against these tough teams, I was one of the guys that they can count on. And I was showing really, really good success at that t- at that position. Uh, it just really came natural to me as a defense alignment. Um, and our coach Dwayne Board, unbelievable, who played defense alignment for the Forty uh, ers just really, really helped me along the way as as well. Well, nineteen ninety three was uh, definitely ended very, very tough. Um, going to Dallas and uh, and losing in the championship game. But then uh, 1994 was different, and you know, the big off season, and it was a it was a very special year. Uh, what was the year like for you? And specifically, you kind of got a uh, a wingman in, with uh, with Bryant Young getting drafted in the first round. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? So there was only there's only two press conferences that I ever went to when the Niners draft people when they drafted players. After me, you know, like there's, you go to press conference and meet the guy or whatever, or you just watch it on TV. Brian Young, when they drafted him, I was sitting in the, in the seats in the stands with the media waiting to give him a big hug and say, thank the Lord they got me somebody next to me because uh, Ted Washington <laughs> was released. He had an injury, so they brought BY in, and me, right away me and him clicked right away. Um, and then they didn't just stop there. They got Ken Norton, Gary Plummer. You know, they brought in Deion Sanders came in, uh, and Richard Dent, Richard Dent, Charles Mann, Ricky Jackson. All these Hall of Fame players are now on my defense. They're on. You know, we're in the huddle. We huddle, I huddle up with Richard Dent next to me, Kenny Norton calling the play, and Deion behind me. 
so it was it was really really special because we we were playing at a, such a high level that there was no offense out there that can beat us. There was just nobody out there that can touch us. At any given Sunday, it was, our model was not how bad we was going to beat them, it's how many points the offense was going to put on the field, on the, on the scoreboard. That's how we went into some games. All right, now between 1995 and 1997, the 49ers were very much in the hunt to get back to the Super Bowl. What basically happened to make you guys come up short? Was there something missing from that team that the 94 team had, or was it just not playing 49ers football during those playoff games? You know, with all the the, the, the division championships and things like that, it was always – I think we just – we were always missing one key ingredient or one player or whatever – you know they they credit a lot of the Super Bowl run in the ninety. You know when we won the Super Bowl, the Dion coming over, which it you know takes more than just one guy or things like that. I just think there was always in every like when we played Green Bay for that championship game in ninety seven. You know a key a key play just really knocked us out and, and things like that. So. We always had the right ingredients. We just we get to the big game, and for some reason, you know, the ingredients didn't mix well that day. Uh, the players, great player, great locker room, everything. Guys really positive on each other. And I think with a lot of successes, whatever play, if you have that bad play, try not to let it ruin that whole game. So, you know, some guys, you know, I think just – we just missed that one ingredient in all those big games that we had. Well, 1997 was a very special year for you personally as you led the NFL in sacks. It was like 15 sacks. You're in the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year Award. How special was that for you, and how did things fall into place for you to be that successful in 97? Well, to tell you the truth, it wasn't, you know, in 96 I had a SOPAR year. Uh, fighting injury and, and things like that. And my D-line goes to Wayne Board on the, during the off season. He says, hey, Stubby, let's go get a beer and have some pizza. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, he wants to start start the season and whatnot. Really, he was just telling me, look, you got to step it up this year, you know. Because being one of those guys that they can always count on and then you have a so par year, that's just not the nine away. You know, number 94 whether it be Charles Haley who wore the number 94, Dana Stubblefield who's wearing the number 94, we always can count on that. And Stubby, as we actually said, Stubby, you, you don't do anything, you're going to be traded out of here. So when we met after that, <laughs> it was full board, baby. I was just, you know, I was just on a mission just to, just to solidify myself as a Niner for the rest of my life. Um, and just keep these guys in mind of who I was and how I do things and and make sure my teammates, especially the offensive guys, that they can count on me. All right. Now, when you were with the 49ers, you played for Coach George Seifert, who was a former defensive coordinator. You want to tell us a little bit what it was like to co- or play for Coach Seifert? Seifert, I love Seifert. You know, a lot, a lot of guys on the team liked Seifert at the time. I really, really liked Seifert. He was uh, – he was one of those coaches that he wasn't going to get in your face and yell at you. He, you know, he would come up to you like he would come up to the defensive line and he'd say, you guys see the way that other team's ragdogging your quarterback? And walk away. And we'd be looking at each other like, <laughs> you know, are you kidding me? I'm not blocking for the quarterback. <laughs> you know, so he would do little things like that, but all in all, you know, off the field, Coach Seifert was a good guy. He would, you know, he'd talk to you about your life and things like that. He would always make sure you were at the top of your game. Uh, whatever you had to do to get there, he would help you get there. And you might not like his the way he did it, and not a lot of people did, but he would try to get the best out of you, no matter who you were. If you were a first-rounder, a second-rounder, a free agent, you know, we had free agents like Ed McCaffrey, who was an awesome player, um, you know, and once he got traded, he just really blossomed. 
something with Denver, so he knew how to get the best out of you. Now, I remember very well the, 90, the 97 uh, defensive line with you and Bryant, and uh, he had Roy Barker and Chris Dolman and also Kevin Green that year. And it ended in the championship game, and I remember watching thinking, boy, this, is, this, this line is really something. I can't wait for just next year. But unfortunately for us Snyder fans, uh, you had such a great year, right, um, before a contract, which was really good for you, and uh, you ended up going to Washington and playing with uh, Washington from uh, 98 to, like, 2001. Tell us about your time over uh, at Washington. You know, it's um, I, I whenever I speak to these guys, some of these players nowadays, and they're looking to switch teams and, and move on, and yes, the money's good, and yes, you know, you got to provide for your family and things like that. But I, I tell them to really, really take a look at that team and make sure you fit in that team. The one thing with me is, you know, I didn't want to leave San Francisco, and that was evident in all the interviews and everything I said and did, but it didn't work out. So, I, you know, Washington was, you know, offering the most money, so I took it. At that time, it seemed like a good choice, but if I had to do it all over again, I would have probably chose somewhere else just because once you get inside the team and you see the team, you see where that team was, North Turner was on the bubble as far as head coach, Snyder came in, guaranteed Norv the head coaching job, fires him the next day. So, you know, at that point of my career, I didn't want to be a part of a rebuilding type organization. You know, I, I, you know, I wasn't young anymore. Not that I lost any steps, but, you know, it just wear and tear on you. So uh, I, I, out of it, I made some great friends, got to know some coaches, great players out there. Um, and then, of course, I come back home to the Niners. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, what made you want to return? I think you kind of answered that right there. But, I mean, just go ahead and kind of explain your love for funny the how, Niners and put about your back. No, it was funny how it worked out. And, you know, you always say that, oh, man, somebody's looking out for you. And actually they were. I just get cut from the Washington Redskins. I mean, I get cut. They said, oh. Marty Shine, there's a new man. He's a new head of this ball. But, you know, they hired him, and his first thing was cutting Dana Stubblefield. I knew Marty from Kansas City because Kansas and the Chiefs are about 30 minutes away, so it wasn't like, okay, they got this guy who doesn't know football who's cutting me. So Marty touched me, and I said, all right, Marty, you know what? Good luck to you. I'm at home in my office scratching my head, like, what am I going to do next? The phone rings, and it's Dwayne Board, the defensive line coach from the Niners. He's calling me, and he was asking about uh, he was asking about one of the linebackers for the Redskins, Derek Smith. And I said, Pee Wee. He said, What? I said, You know, I just got cut from the from Washington. He says, What? I said, They just cut uh-huh. me today. He said, No. I said, Pee Wee. They just cut me today. I thought you were calling to offer me a job. He said, well, I'll, we're, we're going to offer you and Derek a job. I said, Pee Wee, you get me back, and I, it won't be no mistake. <laughs> so he's calling me, asking me about Derek Smith, the linebacker, what kind of player he was, what kind of teammate he was, because they were scouting him. And then here it is, they brought me and Derek in, you know, to play on the Niners defense. And that's how I got back to the Niners. What a help of Bill Walsh, you know, the late, great Bill Walsh, convincing York to sign me uh, also. But – that's basically how it worked out. What were those uh, those two years like? Um, th- those were probably their most two, the, the two most successful years of the 2000s, the 01 and the 02 seasons with Jeff Garcia and Terrell Owens. What were those two seasons like for you, getting back there and and just kind of reacclimating yourself um, to California and the, and the Niners? Uh, it was great because I was back home. I was back home. You know, I knew the playbook. You know, nothing's changed. A couple little wrinkle dinks in there. But it, it's just a great feeling to be back where you belong. The fans just, you know, they definitely open their arms and welcome you back and things like that. Seeing B.Y., B.Y., coming back with B.Y., getting, you know, getting things rolling with him. Didn't You know, first time I met Jeff Garcia, he was a great player and things like that. So it was just like, you know, the, the, your son has came home. 
And that's basically what it was because the fans really opened up and welcomed me back. The players did too, coaches as well. So it was really good to get back and just like, okay, now I can start just like being me, playing the football I should have been playing that I lost when I went to Washington Redskins. All right. Now, when you got there, I think Steve Mariucci was the head coach. Um, what was it like to play for Mariucci? Was he as annoying as a coach as he is to watch on the NFL Network? <laughs> <laughs> That's brutal. I'm going to tell you you said that. <laughs> That's fine. Have him come on the show and we'll debate whether he's annoying or not. I'll go with it. <laughs> Matt will tell you uh, argue with anybody about anything. So. Yeah, he will. He no, will. Most- Mooch was a good guy. He, uh, what I liked about him is he listened to the players. You know, he had a couple guys that that he called, you know, the leaders of the locker room, basically, that he listened to the players. You know, when the, the whole 9-11 thing went down and they canceled all the games for the week and a couple of players kind of gathered around and brought this idea, hey, Mooch, why don't we all go donate blood? You know, just go down and just get blood. He looked and said, you know what, that's why I like you guys. So not just the players, but the whole building, everybody in the organization, we went to a local blood center and just donated blood. You know, uh, so he's one of those guys who definitely cares, uh, and he listens to the team, and that's what I love about him. Uh, and, you know, he got, he got fired a bum way as well. But, you know, that's that's how that's the na- nature of the beast in the business. Is if you're not winning ball games, we're going to find somebody that does. Well, after uh, after the 2002 season, you, you just finished your tenth season, and uh, you ended up in uh, in Oakland. What were the circumstances behind that, and uh, also uh, your, uh, your your retirement? You know, I I, I enjoy my time over in Oakland just because of Al Davis. You hear all this stuff about Al, you, you, you read about it and all this other stuff, but when you talk to, to the when, – when, when, when you would talk to Al on the phone, he, Al, as old as he was, he still was the right in the right mind of football. He knew all my stats, every game, my plays and everything. This is 2000 or two, They just got back from the Super Bowl. And he told me, he said, all right, Dana – you're going to be the only person I pick up on this team for this off season. Don't let me down. He, this guy, bleed. I mean, wherever he went, whatever he's wearing, it was silver and black. There was none other than him. He knew everything about you, and I just love that because if I would say, you know what, Coach Davis, say, you know, if we can change this as far as giving us a little more rest, or don't you think we should do this as far as for the tackles inside? He would listen, he would listen, and he would say, okay, well, let me, let me see what we can do. And he, would, he, he was there for the players. He didn't care about the assistant coaches. He was the assistant coach. He didn't care about you. He cared more for his players. Oh, yeah. I, I loved it. I loved it. It was a different, whole different ball game when you play for the Raiders and you, you line up and you put that silver and black on and you're in a black hole and you have the uniform on. But if you're a different colored uniform, you know, you get treated different. <laughs> yeah, right, so different. A- after retiring, yeah. you, got, you got into a little bit of broadcasting. Tell us how that came about. Yeah, you know, um, there's one thing playing. You find out that the media can help you or they can hurt you, depending on how you wanted to treat them. Um, and when I was a rookie, Kevin Fagan, Ted Washington said, hey, rookie, you speak for the defensive line. Okay, whatever you say, sir. So just from that one rookie year, whenever any reporter had a question for anybody on the defensive line, I was the one that had to speak for that person. And that's how I got to be so good with the media and know them all. I knew them all just because of that one year. And uh, afterwards it, it, it worked out that, you know, some of them was like, hey, why don't you come on the show? Let's do a show. We get you your own show, things like that. And it just uh, just kind of blossomed from there. Well, I know that uh, you were, you're a part of the, uh, the Super Bowl committee. At least you were for Super Bowl 50. 
Uh, tell us a little bit about that, and if there's a little bit more to it than, than I'm aware of, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how that came about and, and what you do. You know, um, it, it was great because just to, to be involved in just what was going to take place, not just a, a Super Bowl, but this was the big 5-0. Uh, and being with these guys in meetings and just as a ex-player who played in the Super Bowl and been to other Super Bowls, just kind of giving them the point of view of, you guys might want to consider this. You might want to consider So just kind of giving them ideas about the area and things they, you know, not able to think outside the box with. Uh, you know, they're, they're so worried about the techie part of it where we had 5 million people visit during those weeks, uh, San Francisco, 5 million people visit that, you know, Super Bowl City during that week. So I just had to let them know. I was like, look, you guys got to bring it because this is, you know, this is going to be it. And just giving them ideas of as far as traffic and time and things like that. All right. So what keeps you busy these days? Same thing. Uh, I still do some broadcasting. I do, uh, you know, working with KMBR. Um, and I have kids. You know, kids is uh, – I got an 18-year-old in college. I got a, a 16-year-old in high school sophomore. I got a 4-year-old about to start kindergarten, and I got a 2-year-old about to start pre-K. So you got your hands full. That's outstanding. <laughs> Especially that 18 and 16 year old stuff. <laughs> I believe the words you used uh, when when you jumped when you were on our Niner show was uh, there's always a lot happening in the Stubble Field house. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. oh yeah, always a lot happening. You know, um, and my 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 kids is you know I let them play all their sports with all of their friends. My oldest daughter goes to the University of Kansas. She's on the rowing team, and my son, my 16 year old son, is on he plays for Bellman basketball team and you know my uh, my four-year-old she doesn't like going to the basketball games because of a loud noise uh right now she wants to be a singer uh with anna from elsa and anna from you know the disney show so yeah oh that was my daughter i got yeah. a granddaughter so that watches that all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they keep me busy and you know just doing some spots and shows and and I work with the 49ers alumni. Uh, I work with some of those guys, Guy McIntyre and Keena Turner. I work with those guys as well. So I try to keep keep as close as I can to the Niners as well. All right, my final question, Dana. Since we brought, I mean, have you ever played on a football field where the corner of the end zone went up a hill? <laughs> it's an inside as a joke. running back. <laughs> I'm assuming this is an inside joke for uh, – Yeah, Taylor Heidi <laughs> told me a quarter of the end zone actually went up a hill. It did. It went, and that's the funny when We used to get down there and say, Randy, throw it to the hill. And he would know what I was talking about because to me the corner in the zone ran up the middle field. That is so hysterical. No, never have I played but at Taylor – no, actually, the old Taylor High School football field. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yep, exactly. Loved it. Yeah, I loved were, it. They ruined it with that turf field crap. There's no hill with a field going up, and I don't think anymore. So. <laughs> I haven't been to a game since they switched fields, so I couldn't tell you. Maybe they, maybe they installed it just for old times' sake. I don't know. But hey, oh, Dana, wow. it was awesome having you call in, um, Matt. You got any final words for Dana? Well, just it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to to, to talk to you again. I uh, love uh, hearing all the stories. Uh, appreciate all you did for the 49ers, and I uh, uh, would love to have you back. Oh, guys, anytime. You guys know how to get a hold of me. Uh, Facebook is an amazing tool, and, you know, it's uh, it's just great to be on and, and, and talk and tell people these stories because they get to know guys and they really get to see some of the other side of football that they don't like, but it's good to hear. Uh, so I'm happy to come on anytime you guys you guys have time for me. All right. Thanks a lot, Dana. All right. You guys have a good one. Okay. Hey, I, I want to remind everybody to check out thegruelingtruth.net. Um, interviews coming up next week. We have Mike Bass on Tuesday. He was the defensive back that intercepted Gary Upremian, Super Bowl Seven, scored the only touchdown for the Redskins in that game. Wednesday we have former Houston Oilers defensive lineman Mike Stenzerud. Um, we also have a few new shows. We have a Tuesday night draft show. 
where we will break down the AFC North and the NFC North team needs this week. Um, that will be hosted by Mike Cannon, who's new to the network. We will also have a weekly boxing show starting next Friday night with myself and Jeremiah Presser. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Matt, any final words tonight? No, I just really, uh, I mean, that 94 team was real special to me. I mean, I, I was a lot younger. I was just starting to get into football um, a little bit before they won in, in 88 and 89. I was, I was a little bit older in 94, and uh, Dana was, him and B.Y. were, those are the two guys. I just I remember I just loved the, the defensive line and um, really cool to talk to uh, someone that you grew up watching. And uh, he's he's a great interview. Got lots of great stories, and I, I like I like talking to him. Oh, I appreciate it. And, and yeah, that was a great team. It was a special team, and we had fun. Then. We had fun, and hopefully they can get back. All Absolutely. right, guys. Um, make sure you check out thegruelingtruth.net. Check out our sponsors, steelbergbox.com, gridironmode.com. So for Dana Stubblefield, Matt Andrew Scavage, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. I'd like to tell you about our new website, www.steelbergbox.com, a monthly fan box service built to take a fan's passion for the Pittsburgh Steelers to a whole new level. Offering three different fan boxes to choose from and several different plans, fans are guaranteed to get way more value in their box than they paid. It's simple. Drop by www.steelbergbox.com. Choose the category and size. Men, women, youths, and infants. Then... Pick one of our three Steelers merchandise fan boxes. After you choose your fan box, hit subscribe. Then choose your monthly plan. You're done. Go Steelers!